We've talked a lot on this channel about how COVID has acted as an amplifier of many of the existing problems, and most of all, the problem of finding truth or sense-making. And it sometimes seems that the pandemic is perfectly calibrated to create maximum division and disagreement. BJ Campbell thinks he knows why. He's the author of the wonderfully named blog, Hand-Waving Freakoutery, which is all about the sense-making crisis. And what I've seen now, really, is that the people who were screaming about the sense-making crisis in 2018, they have lost all their sense-making ability post-COVID because they're trapped in elements of the sense-making crisis <laughs> itself and don't realize that they're trapped in it. I've jumped from it being really just kind of a concept in 2018 to it being something so profound in 2020 that it is deciding it's a matter of life and death for some people and nobody realizes that it is because they're all stuck in it. <laughs> it's, it's that bad. It's pretty terrifying and strange. So in this conversation, BJ goes deep and theoretical and introduces a new concept, the egregore which was originally an occult idea, meaning a non-physical entity that arises from a collective group of people, something like a hive mind. All the elements for the sense-making crisis create fertile ground for hive minds to develop, and the hive minds would exist at a layer up that you would not be able to tell that they existed. Is that true? I don't know. That's the thing that I've been thinking about recently, and it seems very explanatory for some of the stuff that's going on. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and also just to quickly let you know, we're running our groundbreaking Sensemaking 101 course again, starting in February, with practices and techniques for better sensemaking, and faculty including John Baveke, Diane Musho Hamilton, Sarah Ness, and Daniel Schmachtenberger, and check the show notes for details. BJ, welcome. Thanks. So you've got a blog called Hand Waving Free Countery, which kind of the clue sounds like it's in the name. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you want, do you want to explain why you chose that name? Oh, um, well, the, the blog evolved from a series of medium posts that I did and um, which originally were about gun policy. Um, and that evolved from a bunch of basically a bunch of Facebook arguments about what was true and what wasn't true about gun policy in the United States and gun statistics in the United States. And a lot of media was grossly misrepresenting things about guns in particular. And um, I was getting sick of cross posting and copy pasting the same stuff over and over again in people's argument feeds because back in, I guess, 2018, Facebook arguing was a very, uh, it's like the national hobby, right? So I tried to find a place to stick it up uh, to where I could just post a link instead. And I found medium.com and I stuck it there. And then it went viral and ended up with a quarter million hits. My first article did. So I was like, oh, nuts. I guess I better write some more. So I wrote about five or six more articles that were all related to unpacking the actual problems of gun violence in the United States and actual ways to fix it and things that don't work. And um, after that was done, I started grinding on trying to figure out why the media was depicting everything wrong and why we couldn't come to a national consensus about gun policy. And it had to do largely with the fact that people's perceptions of reality were different and wrong. Um, and so without a shared perception of reality, you can't have begin to have a discussion. And then why does that happen? And it happens largely because of... Um, profit motives within our media ecosystem where um, people are feeding echo chambers for profit things they want to hear and so the tail wags the dog so then what a media outlet is likely to say is not necessarily something that is true or unique it is more likely something that a echo chamber wants to hear right so then the me the blog stopped being largely about guns and started being about media criticism but as that developed and you started to see more of the dynamics in play, it's like the media are trapped in this sort of game theoretical uh, Nash equilibrium of peddling things to echo chambers, right? And once I started unpacking that, I stumbled into things, honestly, like rebel wisdom who were looking at the sense-making crisis, right? And the sense-making crisis analysis back then was, was, was really tight and it was, you know, it was, I, you know, did a, a podcast with um, Peter Lindbergh and Jordan Hall and that kind of thing, um, digging down into that. Um, and all of that sort of matriculated right before COVID hit. 
And then what I've seen now really is that the people who were screaming about the sense making crisis in 2018, they have lost all their sense making ability post COVID because they're trapped in elements of the sense making crisis <laughs> itself and don't realize that they're trapped in it because they forgot all the stuff they were talking about then. And now they're talking about other stuff now. And it's interesting watching Rebel Wisdom pivot into the COVID discussion and then um, other affiliated folks pivot into the COVID discussion and take different platforms and different takes, you know, and the name of the publication was hand-waving free cattery because that was basically the mechanic of how, what was our sense-making crisis, our sense-making capacity uh, as a people had turned into profitized panic, right? Which is a topic that you guys have covered before. So, you know, we're in a similar space. We're kind of parallel tracks. I don't know that, um, all the analysis I've seen in Rebel Wisdom exactly matches up with our analysis framework at my publication, but it's close. It's close enough to to where it'll um, with some terminology overlap. You can you can pretty much talk the same language. So, yeah, I mean, let's let's dig in in a minute into how COVID has just been sort of dragged into this same dynamic and what the dynamic, mm-hmm. what the kind of the generator patterns are that are, that are creating that dynamic, but. I was interested in what you just said about how the people who are paying most attention to the sense-making crisis have actually now been caught up in it because of COVID. Do you oh, want to completely. expand on that a little bit? Well, I mean, I think the easiest uh, the easiest example for people who are within the sort of rebel wisdom media ecosystem are the fact that Brett Weinstein and Sam Harris went completely opposite directions, right? I mean, that's obvious. It's like, well, they went like that, completely to other sides of the coin. And, you know, if you try and figure out... And this doesn't make a lot of sense to people who had like invested their um, faith in the intellectual dark web as a sense making apparatus, right? Or like, why are they going opposite? But for people who had stepped out of the sort of like intellectual dark web worshipers and were looking more at the sense making crisis itself, it makes complete sense that they would go opposite directions because of the how the sense making crisis evolves, right? It's all about um, people not having the same shared understanding of the world. Right. And so you, you would expect that two people have different understandings of the world to go different directions with this thing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And the, um, and the more profound thing is that this kind of happening to everyone, um, at the same time, and even, uh, you know, uh, government officials, your local doctor, you know, like if you pick two different doctors, they're gonna have two t- completely different opinions about how to treat COVID, particularly in the early stages. So, um, so then that impacts people's the sense making crisis is impacting people's like personal health at that point. And we've jumped from it being really just kind of a concept in 2018 to it being something so profound in 2020 that it is deciding it's a matter of life and death for some people. And nobody realizes that it is because they're all stuck in it. <laughs> it's, it's that bad. It's pretty terrifying and strange. Was it inevitable that COVID was going to be dragged into this? Um, I think it's inevitable that all things are going to get dragged into this. I think this is such a profound problem um, that and it is so deep and it is so irrecognizable for most people that we need to expect that every issue that ever could matriculate is going to be subject to this sense-making crisis until it is solved. And the only area I have seen attempt to solve it is unfortunately China. And China is doing it by establishing a government approved narrative and extreme censorship. It's like the only way that they've been able to get out of it and mm-hmm. everybody else is stranded in it, right? Because of the game theoretical dynamics of how information is shared. Something else you mentioned offline, which is everyone likes to, everyone who talks about the sense making crisis likes to say, oh, yeah, well, they're obviously captured, but right. no one realizes that they're captured as well. Everyone's captured by this. Everyone, I'm captured by this, and you are captured by this. And that because you have, there's an inability to be able to take a wider breadth because it's because of the fundamental natures of the sense making crisis itself. Now, uh, Rebel Wisdom has covered this in depth, um, but some of their analyses are deeper and um, I don't want to say convoluted because it has a, um, a negative tone, but um, more complex than I think they need to be. I think you, you can really probably summarize the whole thing in about two or three minutes, and we can open with that if you want. So, um, <laughs> yeah, let's, here, let's here, crack my knuckles here. Um, the Internet connects the entire world and creates an infinite 
not an infinite, but the upper bound of information is no longer uh, how many newspapers there are. It's the number of people they are, right? So that upper bound of available information vastly exceeds anybody's ability to process it all, right? So um, it used to be that there was a world and then our visions of the world were mitigated by media organizations and books and publishers and things like that. And they were the gatekeepers of truth. And was their truth always right? Not necessarily, but the fact that the truth was conveyed was something that everybody agreed on made it easier for us to interact as a society, even if perhaps we were interacting in the wrong way. Like there's a case that we never should have gone to Vietnam and had that war. And the reason why we went there was because the sense makers were duping us, for instance. But the fact that there was a shared narrative about what was going on did allow people to come together and achieve a task. Even if the task is bad, they can at least get together and achieve a task. But at the same time, there's a social layer of it that is underappreciated, in my opinion. A lot of the folks, you know, talking about the, um, the social dilemma and all that kind of stuff, screaming about algorithms. Well, yes, but people also self-sort among people who are like-minded. And the greatest counterexample to ha I have to the idea that Facebook is the one that's doing this is a Reddit, right? I mean, Reddit's algorithm is extremely simple. You join a group of like-minded people and the like-minded people either upvote or downvote an article and the upvotes get to the top and the downvotes go to the bottom, which tightens the echo chamber inside what you joined. And there's nothing else to it than, than that. It's their algorithm is extremely simple. It's not AI. It's not driven to make you go insane. It's not driven to engage traffic. All it is, is just, do you like this or not? It's just the thumbs up, thumbs down. So the fact that there is even a thumbs up, thumbs down is a social algorithm that's baked into human minds. And it is, in my opinion, more powerful than any kind of Facebook algorithm that drives engagement that they could have. Okay. So there's two layers to that algorithm. So when we start pivoting over to getting all our news from social feeds, then it becomes extremely important for media agencies to feed an uh, echo chamber what it wants to hear. Because the moment they feed their own echo chamber something that it doesn't want to hear, they lose subscriptions or they don't get clicked. That was the state of the thing when I stepped into the uh, looking at gun policy thing. It, was, it became very obvious that what they were doing is feeding people what they wanted to hear, and they were manipulating statistics to do so. I think the bottom level of the sense-making crisis is something that I think, I don't think relevant wisdom has touched on at all. And I, it's, this sounds a little bit conspiracy theorist, but I'd like to lay it out at least for consideration. So I'm not saying necessarily believe me on this, but consider this. So when you're interacting with your Facebook feed, you have a series of things, they scroll past, you have the option to either like or share them, right? Um, same kind of thing for Instagram and all the other social media stuff. It's, you have a feed of information, you decide whether or not to share this information, decide whether or not to upvote this information. That's what a, a neuron does in a brain. So a neuron has a nucleus, the nucleus attached to dendrites, the dendrites get, get signals, which is binary signals from other, other neurons. And then however those come in, the neuron has a, some kind of generator function inside of itself that evaluates that and decides whether or not to fire a signal down the axon, and then that goes off to other neurons, right? That's what you're doing on your Facebook. You're behaving as a neuron in a brain. And when things go viral, things propagate, when things propagate through social networks. I mean, there's a lot of study on this. It looks kind of like a brainwave, right? It looks like something that's passing through a brain. The, the rub is this, the rub is several things, is first off, the neuron doesn't know what the brain's thinking. The neuron exists at a level down from the brain. So if you and I and everybody else were participating as neurons in a brain, we could not even understand, comprehend the thought that the brain is having because that thought is one level up, right? It's like a Kurzweil singularity thing. It's like the next level intelligence. How would you even know that there's a next level intelligence? You couldn't talk to it, right? So postulate for a moment that if you could web enough people together in a like and share network, that they would exceed a certain level to where their, their network itself was effectively a thinking superorganism one level up from them. And that there's no way you could know that one way or another. Like the thing I'm talking about right now is kind of unprovable. Now postulate that 
if you had some people in one social network, some other people in another social network, those two social networks might have these kind of internet entities that are thinking different things and are competing with each other for overall available brain space in the human population to survive. So there's some talk in like very dark uh, intellectual circles that I traffic in where they're, they're calling these things egregores because that's what an egregore is. Like the, the definition of an egregore was it was a, a kind of demon that manifests out of a shared belief system. And um, I think it's possible that we are so far down the sense-making rabbit hole that those kind of things are literally the things that are influencing people's behavior at this point. Some of people. So it's kind of anyway. it's kind of like a cross between a hive mind and a emergent phenomenon of the sense making crisis. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the all the elements for the sense making crisis create fertile ground for hive minds to develop, and the hive minds would exist at a layer up that you would not be able to tell that they existed. Is that true? I don't know. It's the thing that I've been thinking about recently, and it seems very explanatory for some of the stuff that's going on. If you, um, I was uh. I was on a Twitter conference call. Just, just, to, just to kind of stop there for a second. So yeah, let's, let's expand that. Right. I mean, I've heard the term egregore before. I think uh -huh. what um, where it becomes useful is whether it has any explanatory capacity. Right. Like, does it make sense to say, well, the woke egregore is behaving like this or the mm -hmm. MAGA egregore is behaving like this? Right. And if it does, and I've seen people use that in a kind of shorthand way where it seems to mm. make some useful sense, then in a right. way for me, that's kind of the test of whether it's not necessarily whether the test of whether it's true, but it it certainly is a test of whether it's pointing towards a phenomenon, a potentially underlying phenomenon that 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 is real. Right. I mean, like, you know, the, the test of whether of whether this concept is of value is whether it's useful. And um, ultimately, what you'd like is for it to be predictive. Um, it's tough to it's tough to make predictions. Sometimes I'll give that a shot. You know, um, like I one of my predictions for the woke egregore inside the next year is that they abandon Latinx entirely. I think they're probably going to ditch that, um, and then they're going to forget that they ever did it after they ditch it, in the way they forget some of their other indoctrinations that get um, uh, deprecated, because that's kind of how their 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 egregore is really interesting because it has really it's got a really rigorous morality but it also has update mechanics to its morality and their update mechanics are so good that they memory hole what they used to do and then they forget that they ever did it and then they, they're all doing something else um and there's a lot of anti-woke people and i don't profess to be in the woke or the anti-woke space i'm just kind of like when i step into this i'm more in the social analysis space so i view it as just something else to analyze I think a lot of the anti-woke folks don't even realize how wokeness works. Um, but I think, but it, the the woke egregore, if we're going to use that phrase, is very mature because it's been going for a long time, and it was one of the early or early ones that were born because it was born among a people who are have been online and plugged into social media for decades. It's had time to evolve. Um, you know, some of the other ones are newer. And so they're not as uh, they're not as robust. They haven't got their update mechanics stuff totally figured out yet. That kind of thing. Um, but that's that's what I've seen with that. And what we've seen, right, really, is the emergence of uh, COVID narrative egregores that are allied to other egregores by Venn diagram overlap proximity. So your, um, you know, your. Uh, your lockdown aggregor that it, it's sort of the, I think what's uh, Peter Lindbergh was calling this COVID thesis folks are like the vax, yeah. the lockdown, the masks, like, and, and then periphery other ideas. Like those are their kind of their, their. Pencils. Yeah. I was thinking that, that that's the, the new emergent egregor, the new emergent group mind are what has been described as thesis antithesis. Mm. So mm -hmm. Just to go on that, if someone's watching and they're not familiar with it, thesis is kind of mainstream narrative. COVID is dangerous. Lockdowns are necessary. Masks work. Um, everyone should be vaccinated. And the antithesis is um, the yeah the the antithesis is more um, vaccine skeptical, lockdown skeptical, um, 
and they which explains also why certain beliefs that you don't think should be correlated are correlated right and the phenomenon that pretty much everyone has noticed which is if you know one belief about someone you tend to know all of their other beliefs as well which is right. um the sign of someone who's captured i think right yeah totally so um you know like inside that there's like there's true things and questionable things inside the thesis argument and there's true things and questionable things inside the antithesis argument right inside both but if you drill down to them even the people who are very like you know very prominent and very intelligent and very educated inside each of these um information silos have adopted some of the you know less credible information about you know less credible positions within their silos um but just purely because of what their uh, their social feed looks like, their version. Is it a good idea? Different. I do have a question yeah. here about where where is the mainstream sense making going wrong, and where is the heterodox sense making going wrong? I know you had a list of the the former. Maybe give a couple of examples or a few examples. Oh uh, well, you know. So <laughs> first thing I have to predicate is that this is my opinion based on the best sense making I could do, and. Uh, yeah. I have a, you know, I have a group of you know, maybe a hundred of my readers that all sit around in Slack and we try and put our heads together and figure things out, but we are also an echo chamber, right? So, so everything I'm going to say here is biased by, you know, a, not necessarily an emergent egregore because we're not big enough, but by, certainly biased by uh, my feet. Um, I don't think masks work, for instance, like masks. If you go to the CDC website and you look at their mask efficacy studies, they did one that was a comparison between masks optional and masks mandated municipalities. And they found that the difference in spread for masks, which is kind of, that's the level that you need to analyze this, not how much sneeze gets through a piece of cloth, but whether or not the policy works. Um, the, the, the difference in spread was maybe a half a percent um, at the beginning, and then it climbs to like maybe one and a half percent. So if you've got 200 cases in a mass optional county, you've either got 199 to at lowest 197 cases in an identical masks mandated county. And that's not even necessarily showing that it's masks. It could be that when you shift over to a mask mandate, people avoid the grocery store more often because they don't want to have to wear a mask. Right. You know what I mean? So it could be that they didn't control for distancing in that study. So the, um, so like masks really don't help at a population level. And that's one thing that the, the thesis folks have got just completely wrong. Um, and I, my sense at the beginning, when the mask thing came out, it was originally it was masks don't work. Then it was N95s work. Then it was cloth masks work. And it seemed to me like that egregore was group thinking itself into a way to convince the people within it to be able to go out and participate in the economy. Because at the time, the folks that were inside that bubble were saying, I'm going to stay in my house forever and you cannot make me go out of the house. That was what their mindset was at the time. So it seems to me as if the mask thing was an emergent phenomena within that bubble to try and alleviate the problems that had been generated by COVID fear that was primarily centralized in that bubble. And if you go and you look at statistics, if you look at polls, the, the folks within that bubble are vastly overestimate how deadly COVID is and how likely you are to get hospitalized with it compared to folks on in the red bubble, right? The red bubble also overestimated, but they're much closer to reality. The reality is that not very many people get killed by COVID and never have. Um, so I think that's kind of where that came from. You know, um, another thing that's, it's been, you st you're still seeing people inside the, um, the thesis bubble who are hanging on to the belief that this is a zootonic, a zoonotic spread, a zoonotic origin, right? That this didn't come from a lab. And at this point, thinking this didn't come from a lab should be considered a tenfold act conspiracy theory with as much information has come out about Peter Dazak and EcoHealth and all that. And I don't know, have you covered any of that in Rebel Wisdom at all before? Yeah, we also did a dialogue between uh, one of the few, the only dialogues between someone who believes that it was and someone who believes that it wasn't. Okay. All right. Yeah, I missed um, that. Well, that's so, good. There's no no need for us to go down that rabbit hole right now. Yeah. But like, you know, I'd, I would find it, I would be amazed if it 
came out that this wasn't a lab leak. The the coincidences are just too incredible with Dazak pro- literally proposing to DARPA to design COVID-19 in 2018 and getting his grant proposal turned down. I mean, that's just what happened at Wuhan. <laughs> so, you know, either he got hired by somebody else to do it, like a different black you know, government entity in the USA or the Chinese hired him to do it, or the Chinese saw his proposal and stole his idea and did it themselves. Like that, those are the things that make the most sense to me, you know, one of those three. Um, but, uh, or somebody else stole and hired the Chinese to do it, you know, who knows? And what about, and what about on the antithesis side? What do you think people are getting wrong? Um, well, okay. So, um, it was the, the fellow that was on Rogan that got all the hits uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, what was his name? It just flew out of my Peter mind. Peter McCullough. Okay. McCullough. Well, like McCullough has, he's a, like a sort of a flag waver for the uh, antithesis group. And they were obvious things. And, and I, I liked the podcast and I think he's getting a lot of stuff right, particularly about in the zone of early treatment, which is where he's at, right? That's his happy space. But you could tell whenever he started to step out of the early treatment focus, he was adopting some things that didn't weren't necessarily true. That are being they were really kind of like um, aren't even that popular inside the antithesis space anymore. Like six months ago, antithesis COVID was saying that um, once you get COVID, you can't catch it again. There's no reinfections. That's what antithesis COVID was saying a while ago. And his uh, mental framework hasn't even been updated to the facts yet because you can definitely catch COVID twice. You know, you can catch COVID twice for the same reason that you can catch COVID after being vaccinated. So um, the fact that he was throwing that on the table kind of makes me scratch my head about some of the rest of it. And so then that causes you a problem, right? Is that um, every baby has bathwater in this space. And part of the reason every Does all the bathwater have babies, though? Um, I mean, probably not all of it, but in the larger sense, I think that anybody who's worth listening to has probably got some of both, right? And the reason why is that anybody worth listening to um, is still subject to the sense-making crisis on their phone, right? Mm. So McCullough is like, you know, he, he's an expert at this early treatment thing. And I think he probably had a lot of very valuable things to say about early treatment, but um, personally, anyway, from as far as I've looked into it. But on the flip side, when he says, you know, um, I, I'm pretty skeptical that uh, when, when he jumps down the rabbit hole of um, the vaccine was already designed before COVID got out, right? Those kinds of claims. Um, I don't buy them. And I don't buy him partly because he's also saying things that are verifiably untrue, like you can't catch COVID twice. It makes, it makes sense making very difficult because what people want is they want to outsource their thinking on this to a locus because it's too big for them to think about. Mm. Right. I mean, the, the place I keep coming to with this, when you kind of really look at how difficult the sense making crisis is, the only thing worthwhile that I can say, I think, is stop being so certain. Like, oh, yeah. Dial, dial down the certainty because yeah. people are going to war over things that they can't know. They can't possibly know. They can have strong beliefs about or they've seen someone say something in a convincing way, but it's just like dial down the certainty and learn to learn to navigate better in uncertainty. Like that's right. the only thing you keep coming back to. Right. Uh, that's uh, I think that's that's accurate. Um, and. Uh... You know, I, I think that it would be nice if people took the took the positions of, say, thesis COVID, antithesis COVID, and extrapolated them to what they mean for their own personal behavior. Right. And I think the reds have generally done a better job of this than the blues have. Um the okay COVID is always going to be here it's never going to go away it's in the deer population in the united states it has animal reservoirs you cannot vaccinate the vaccines don't work great anyway um they certainly don't prevent transmission so if they don't prevent transmission you can't make COVID go away with the vaccine right if zero COVID is done so the reds kind of were like well if zero COVID is done then 
we're going to put on our mantle of small s stoicism and go about our daily lives and just deal with it and um so in some ways they're searching for a sense-making apparatus that justifies their already adopted behavioral position mm-hmm. right and i think that's going on with um thesis COVID as well people are like I have doubled down and tripled down on social media and told all my friends that I'm canceling Christmas. I've canceled it twice. I cannot believe that I would um, have been wrong about canceling Christmas twice. So I need something that tells me that my decision was a good decision. Right. And so they're more likely to adopt the thesis position as a justification for behavior that they've already done. And you said before, like, we're all captured. Do you know where you're captured? I think it's almost impossible to be able to answer that question by the definition of how it's drawn up, mm. right? If I, may, I can make an argument that everyone's captured, and it seems to me as if that argument is clean, but part of that argument is that people who are captured can't know that they're captured. So if I buy that part of the argument, then I literally can't answer your question. See what I'm saying? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, kind of but, silly that way, but... But it sort of comes back to what I was saying before about certainty. Right. Because recognizing that, that you are by definition captured because everyone is captured, should at least dial down the certainty that you feel about particular topics. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I, you know, absolutely. Um, like, you know, every, a lot of people are talking about Omicron right now. Um, and one of the things in uh, antithesis COVID that I'm seeing in about Omicron is, is this okay? So Omicron, Omicron spreads a lot faster. Its infection profile is, is a lot more mild in theory. Um, there's some debate right now over whether or not that's simply because we're seeing a lot more vax people get it, or whether it actually literally has a milder infection profile even for the unvaxed. But my sense from talking to folks and like doctors in South Africa is that the reason they found this at all was because they had an unusual symptom profile and they started trying to sequence the COVID that was giving them the unusual symptom profile. So I think the symptoms of it are milder. Um, we have emergent studies a couple of days ago saying that uh, Omicron recovery gives you uh, um, gives you immunity versus Delta and all the prior big ones. Mm. Um, so like there's some, so the, so antithesis COVID is like, ah, this is great. We finally get to have our natural immunity argument like really robustly, right? So they're running with that. And what they're saying, well, look, this is basically just a, I mean, there's some people saying the argument that this is really, it's just a transmissible vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. In some ways. And that argument may turn out to be true. I don't know. I have looked deeply at the Georgia numbers right now and our, the ramp up in, um, as I live in Georgia in the United States, our current COVID ramp up is two and a half times steeper than any other ramp we've had in any other uh, um, outbreak. So it's obviously spreading really fast. Um, the thing that where antithesis COVID, I think, may be getting wrong on this is they're like, oh, well, viruses tend to evolve towards less deadly variants over time and because of evolutionary pressures. And this is a known thing, and I don't necessarily, I don't disagree with it in general, but it is that effect is much more profound in very deadly viruses because a very deadly virus doesn't want to kill its host because it wants to spread more, right? Mm. COVID wasn't that deadly to begin with. And so that social pressure to not kill your host really isn't there in a large amount in the first place with COVID. So I don't think that this thing, you know, evolved in that way. Or why? Mm-hmm. And also, it wouldn't. If that were the case, and it would have would have stemmed off a of delta, and it didn't. It like disappeared into some hidden animal reservoir for since the middle of 2020. And so then, there's a few people in the very extreme COVID antithesis corner putting their hats back on and saying, "Well, maybe this thing came from a lab too." Yeah. Well, Yuri right? Dagan is yeah. saying that. Oh yeah. So so it's like I mean, it's not a bad argument if you believe the first thing came from a lab, and you also look at this thing that's been sequestered for a year and nobody's seen it before, and it pops out. Then that's you know arguably could have come from a lab that was still working on COVID after COVID got out. Hmm. And then 
you put the second tinfoil hat on around the first, be like, well, maybe they made it on purpose as a, you know, as a vaccine and even as, as literally a transmissible vaccine. And then it's like, oh, that's, that's a stretch to me. I'm not sure I believe that at all. But what I do believe is that the kinds of people who engineer viruses are looking at this thinking, wow, maybe we can engineer transmissible vaccines. Like, why wouldn't they be thinking that the kind of people who make viruses are, are, you know, they're popping popcorn right now. Right. So, yeah. So the idea that this is a transmissible vaccine, I think it's questionable at the very minimum, but it may be proof of concept for that later on. Yeah. I'm saying at the very minimum, it's, you know, something that those kinds of people who make vaccines are going to be thinking about. Yeah, well, it's a positive. It's it seems so far to be a positive development. I've seen seems some people a- say, yeah, I've seen some people say that it's not because it can coexist with Delta. But the worst situation would be if it coexisted with Delta. But I mean, I I had it recently. I assume it was Omicron. I can't know for sure because they don't give that information. But did you lose your taste and smell? Like- I mean, that's the biggest difference. Yeah. If did you lose your taste and smell or not? No. Okay, then I would say, you know, better than even chance it was Omicron, particularly since you got it recently. Yeah. 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 And it was in London and yeah. it was I mean, ba- yeah. it was barely a cold and yeah. Yeah. Recovered in about three or four days. So I think it's yeah. Anecdote is not evidence, but it's, you know, it's, I think it's it's, it's very likely that what you had was COVID was was a uh, was Omicron. And yeah, Omicron does seem to be a positive development, but this um to get back to it, something that um, antithesis folks are saying, like, yeah, well, now COVID it's transitioned over to common cold area. We don't have to worry about it anymore. And I was like, well, I'm not sure that's true because uh, I'm not sure that Omicron evolved naturally. Hmm. Um, or it could just be that we got lucky with Omicron and there might be an Zeta whenever it comes out is going to be awful. Right. Hmm. I mean, we don't know that for sure. Right. We don't know. It could be that you know, a mutation out of Omicron ends up tremendously deadly. And then that would be terrible because Omicron's affecting kids in a lot mm-hmm. more robust way than prior versions of COVID did. Right. Like that would be yeah. a panic for me as a, as a parent, Like I'm not vaccinating my kids because I don't feel that it's worth it because the kids get over COVID really easily. But if, you know, we got something that was, um, you know, uh, worse than Delta piggybacked on Omicron's transmission rate. I might lock my doors in my house. <laughs> so, you know, who knows? It's, it's hard to say where this thing's going to go, to be honest. You have, we have to maintain skepticism about where it's going instead of just like picking the narrative that makes the most sense for our general position. I, think. I mean, the interesting thing for me, I guess, is that we, we look back at Trump and Trump is a kind of accelerator of the sense-making crisis in 2016 to 2020, and there was a brief period where it felt like, um, I certainly think around the time of the election and then the, the handover, I was kind of thinking, wow, this looks this looks and feels like it's heading towards civil war. It's like the, mm. the temperature was, was raised massively. But what's interesting is that we maybe got a couple of months of that kind of feeling like, okay, the temperature's gone down. And then now we're in a place where they're different topics, but it feels like we're the temperature's raised again. It's it's now about COVID rather than Trump, rather than wokeness, but we're still in the same dynamic. I, I feel as if the sense-making crisis dynamics are going to elevate whatever is going on at any given time to that level, right? Mm. Um, like if you look at COVID, okay, COVID is, it's pretty bad disease, but it's not the measles, right? I mean, it's not polio. And We've been through periods of history where we had these really bad diseases and we didn't weren't at the freak outery level that we are now. Right. Mm. And so what this engine of, of, of failed sense making does is it elevates freak outery to the paramount. And if it can't find one thing to freak out about, it's going to find something else to freak out about. And then everybody is in a constant state of panic. So it, you know, it doesn't, if COVID goes away, it's going to be something else. If that goes away, it's going to be something else. If that goes away, it's going to be something else. And the more this happens, that's, you know, the, the freak outery is the engine for the tightening of the echo chambers and the strengthening of the egregores. So that's what the 21st century potentially looks like. 
is just a rolling series of these things. Um, and that's what I've, I've been saying on my, that's why I named the blog hand waving Creek Gattery. I've been saying that since 2018 when COVID hit, I was like, Oh, well, this is obviously going to play out this way. Everybody's looking around like you're all wrong. And then they're all looking around going, how come everyone's crazy? I'm just looking back at my 2018 articles going, duh. Right. You know, I mean, it's just, and also it's going to happen again. And mm-hmm. also it's going to happen again. People like fighting <laughs> wokeness, for instance. So you, like, you, you, like said, they, you said, the, you said before that you're going to summarize it in two or three minutes and you talk for about 25. Yeah. Well, so you know, can you, can you summarize it in two or three minutes? The sense making crisis itself. Gracious. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, let me see. Um, uh, nigh infinite information and a lack of trusted gatekeepers causes echo chambers, which then feed back on their own information silos to create um, micro insanities. And the fertile ground of these micro insanities provides purchase for potentially next level group intelligences to emerge that are manipulating the people within the echo chamber to behave in a certain way. And do you see those? It, yeah. And do you see those as having agency, or do you see those as being? Because because certainly on the antithesis side, you get the sense that there's always a an active player, whether that's big pharma or whether that's the authorities or whether that's the globalists or whatever. I mean, right. you can kind of name who the them, the they, the them is. Do you think it's the egregore is that a replacement is that the, the is that the ultimate kind of prime mover of the behavior do you think i think in my mind that the people blaming big pharma and the globalists and all that kind of stuff are not seeing the bigger picture which is that this behavior is being enacted by an egregore itself um whether egregores have agency i think is something that if provided they exist in the way that we frame them here it is i think unknowable but I know that their um, primary goal is to survive. If it wasn't, they'd be rubbed out already. And in survival, their primary goal must be to rub out other egregores. So if you see, you know, social behavior that is um, like, you know, root, deep culture war behavior that is uh, framed around trying to rub out another cultural mindset, that's it. You can see it right there, right? Mm. Um, so, like, that's the agency. That's obviously what they must be doing, but that doesn't mean this, that they're necessarily more intelligent than a bug um, in terms of it's like, you know, deepest thoughts and feelings or whatever. I don't know, but I don't know that you would be able to do that. I mean, if, if you were an ant walking through a, a, a yard and you look up and see a human, you don't see a next level intelligence. You see an environmental hazard, mm. right? How would you even know? So nicely summarized. <laughs> cool, man. All right. Well, it's been speak. good talking to you. Yeah. This is this. I'm glad we finally got to sit down and do this because we've been trying for so long and schedules yeah. never worked. So our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho-Hamilton, John Viveki, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.